last week, uh, the talk was entitled, you might not have known this, but The Lion's Roar. And The Lion's Roar is uh, it's a phrase that comes from the Tibetan tradition, and it's a proclamation that everything is workable. It's a proclamation of faith that this life, whatever presents, is workable. Now, by workable, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get sick and get old and die and lose jobs and things like that. That's not a, it's not that kind of a, it's workable. It's a deeper sense that whatever happens, whatever happens, it's possible to find a sense of peace and freedom in the midst. And that when we do, that gives us a heart, and this is the phrase I love the most, a heart that's ready for everything. A kind of undefended openness, because we're not tensing against the future, we get to live this life. That's the gift of faith. We get to live the moment, and because our hearts aren't so armored against what's going to happen, live in a very, with a very undefended heart. What I'd like to do tonight is continue exploring this heart that can be ready for anything, this lion's roar, and do it by just talking some more about what ends up nourishing faith, you know, what gives, what gives us faith, how we get caught, how we get caught in doubts. And, and then mostly I'd like to talk tonight about some of the gifts or blessings that come as we come home to this knowing that it really is workable. If I just said in a, in a nutshell, what is the source of faith? And this is, I think, um, common to all spiritual traditions. Our faith grows as we come to realize our nature is not limited to this ego, personality, or body. As we begin to taste, in a very experiential way, a belonging to something larger, you might call it to loving presence, or to spirit, to God, to this whole web of aliveness, and we have different flavors of it. But in any moment that there's an enlarged sense of belonging, that in some way nourishes our faith. It's really okay. This life is really okay. So, as we know, our conditioning is to identify in a very narrow way. Especially when we're stressed, it's like any sense of openness, we kind of tighten up and we quickly become separate and the world's out there and we've got to defend and we've got to promote and we've got to present. It quick, the conditioning kicks in quickly. And the origin of the conditioning? All things that come into existence have a perception of separation. That's just part of the design. It's part of our evolutionary design. The brain is designed to have a dualistic look at things. So we come into the world that way. And I always uh, think of Joseph Campbell who said, the beginning of all religions is the cry, help. Because we, we're in a predicament, we feel separate, there's uncertainty. Things can go wrong and they will go wrong and our separate self feels very much at risk. So that's the kind of given, that's the setting that we're in where we uh, have a sense that um, we're living from either a self, that there's no place to take refuge in this self, either we're empty, there's no one here, or else what's here is deficient and limited, and the only possible answer to help is maybe out there. So then we get fixated out there, and we don't pay attention to the one place, right here, right now, where we can experience love, where we can experience aliveness, where we can touch awareness itself. We fixate outward. So, the pathway is to learn to pay attention in ways that 
connect us with our belonging. And that's what we're doing here. That's what each week we come together and we say, okay, come into the body, feel the aliveness, listen to your heart, connect with your heart, and then we open it and sense the beings that are here. We sense our belonging. We chant together. What I've noticed is that beyond formal practice, where many people get a taste. I mean, that's what people keep coming back to meditation because it gives us a taste. We quiet down some. We get outside our thoughts. We feel some sense of peace. But we all have tastes outside of formal meditation. Each one of us has a taste of that kind of belonging or well-being. We get that. Um, Sometimes it's just in nature. Sometimes it's beauty. I remember um, some of you might have seen the Shawshank Redemption and there's a scene in it that I'll never forget where there's a prisoner in the library and he turns on classical music and for some reason the sound system's open and this, this very beautiful classical piece is spread throughout the entire premises. And in that time that it spreads throughout the prison, this jungle of a prison system where there's little beauty, every prisoner becomes silent and still. There's this moment of awe at beauty. They're all transfixed for that moment. And and it's so sudden and unexpected that in the heart of that awfulness that there would be this beauty that entrances but that touched something devotional. And we touch that. There are moments of beauty, of, of having a sense of our belonging with another person. There's moments of quietness, of sensing the night sky and the vastness and the mystery that connects us with a kind of inner vastness and mystery. And we, for those moments, sense that belonging beyond this ego self. Those are the moments that fuel faith. So, as I've described, we have this conditioning to touch that, to feel drawn, to begin spiritual practices, and also we know when we're honest with ourselves and we look at our day, like if you just review today, I mean, I can do it and and feel a kind of um, bemused embarrassment sometimes at the uptightness and the reactivity and the small-mindedness, every one of us. We have this, at times, this uh, tender openness and then we get little, we get small, we get self-involved so that the universe all has to do with us and we're just this ego computing, basically everything that happens is either good news for us or bad news for us or else we don't pay attention to it, but we're always filtering things. And sometimes it's a real rationalization, it's difficult and in some way we feel like, okay, this is here to teach me something. It's like the universe has contrived to teach me something or to punish me, you know. There is a a little cartoon with this uh, guy, God's talking to an angel and he's saying to the angel, it's a bit embarrassing to admit but everything that happens, happens for no good reason. (laughs) So it could be a letdown, but the universe is not so focused just on this self. But when we're in that narrowed self-sense, then our our dance with each other also, uh, we're we're very much computing, are we going to get approved of? Are we going to be seen in a way we want to be seen? Is the other going to accept or reject us? Are they going to suffocate us, ask too much? So there's a control piece that goes on that's, that's actually... Um, it's there a lot, that in some way we're trying to control how another experiences us. And we're trying to control when people are close in how, what they do that then affects us, you know? so story for you on this. Some of you might remember uh, a guy named John invites his mother over for dinner and during the meal uh, the mother can't help but noticing how beautiful John's roommate is. So she's long been suspicious that there was a relationship there but this even made her more curious. (laughs) So 
After watching the two interact over the evening, she really assumed there might be more, and reading his mother's thoughts, John volunteered, I know what you might be thinking, but I assure you, Carrie and I are just roommates. Okay, so she goes home. A week later, Carrie comes to John and says, you know, ever since your mother came here for dinner, I've been unable to find the beautiful silver soup ladle. You don't think she did something with it, do you? I doubt it, but I'll email her just in case, he says. So he wrote down, Dear Mother, I'm not saying you did, or I'm not saying you did not do anything with the soup ladle, but it's odd that it disappeared after the dinner. Do you know anything about this? <laughs> Later, he received an email from his mother that read, Dear son, I'm not saying that you do sleep with Carrie, and I'm not saying that you don't, but the fact remains that if she was sleeping in her own bed, she would have found the soup ladle by now. Love, Mother. <laughs> This is titled, Don't Lie to Your Mother. <laughs> so, when we're in that ego self, the, the ego is designed, it's the executor of our business, so it's designed to control. But when we are fully identified with it, that becomes the predominant activity, and that rules out presence, you can't be controlling and be fully present at the same moment. You can't try to control another person, including what they're thinking of you in that moment, and have your heart wide open. Right? Doesn't that make sense? So this identifying with a smaller self blocks out the very experiences that actually nourish our trust. Now, Interestingly, even when we're having trust, even when faith or something comes in the form of hopefulness, sometimes we get really hopeful. And then the, the question is, what, how does that relate to faith when we get hopeful? And some spiritual teachers actually teach, you know, hope is, is danger, you know, there's a danger in hoping. And I want to speak to that a little because I feel like it's a really important area to bring some wise attention to that we can be hopeful about being safe and happy, but it's off, often narrowed hope. In other words, our hope is hitched to certain things working out certain ways. That's a recipe for trouble. When our hope is hitched to something being a certain way, and there's fear that it won't be, then our system is tight and tense. And so, yet it's really quite natural. I mean, you think of, think of your life, and for most of us, we, you know, will hope, let's say for me, I remember my son applying to grad schools, like the fixation, oh, may he get into this school, and that kind of thing. Or we hope for a job, we get, take an interview, we hope we're going to get it. Or, you know, we hope that we find the right mate, or we hope, you know. These are things that are really natural in being human. And to the degree that the hope has a grasping, you know what I mean? That the hope has really got this kind of energy that we're in trouble if we don't have it come true. We're on this roller coaster of hoping and fearing that actually tightens our heart. So there's narrowed hope. But I also want to say there's a wise hope that I feel is essential to our health. And that's a hope that really holds open to possibility it's the hope that our deep aspirations will manifest. It's the hope that this heart really can awaken. It's the hope that we can love fully without holding back. It's the hope that somebody else can find happiness. That kind of hope that's wide open, that actually is just keeping the door open to possibility. It's creative, it's with the flow of things with the infinite amount of different ways things can work out. That is nourishing hope. We can see it with health. When somebody is sick and they, you know, have some disease that's, that they don't know how it's going to turn out, and there's hope in becoming more healthy. But it's not real tight hope, it's kind of just hope in the possibility of health the immune system responds, right? We know this now. We know about the placebo effect. 
when we have a thought or a belief that something's possible, we're receptive and we get more aligned to having it happen. The same thing's true in spiritual life that to the degree there's some hope that we can let go of controlling so much, that we can enter the flow, there's some hope that we can let love in. I know so many people that, you know, will do, we'll start doing some deep work together and when I get to the point of, well, can you feel that that person loves you? There's a tch, because I'm not worthy of loving. We're going, to get, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. So hope is, is, is this open to possibility is part of the grounds of faith. It's part of what creates an atmosphere for faith. And that faith grows as we keep touching into presence. Every time we touch into a sense of belonging to the flow of this moment-to-moment experience, there's a little less of the ego self being solidified in a little more space. Every time we pay attention to the love with another person, we feel enlarged and there's a little more faith. I think of it, the word faith is a little misleading. In a way, the practice is one of faithing. It's like, um, it's a verb, that our practice is one of entrusting ourselves to the moment, entrusting ourselves to love taking this ego self and taking the chance to give ourselves to something larger. It's not faith, it's faithing. And the more we faith, we're doing this faithing practice, the more that lion's roar, that heart that's ready for everything, begins to glow. So one of the ways I think it's useful to think of it, and I often use the metaphor of a spacesuit self, that we that we move around, our ego is like a spacesuit that's got certain um, ways of defending and certain ways of navigating. And the, uh, the delusion is that I'm the spacesuit and we forget who's looking through. We forget the awareness and the tenderness and the space of connectedness that's much bigger than any uh, spacesuit covering. When we practice this entrusting, just letting go into this moment, that spacesuit becomes more transparent, more fluid, more porous. And what happens is the, the light of this universe begins to shine through. You begin to sense who you are. I'll read you from Emerson. This is one of my favorite Emerson quotes. He says, Within each of us is the soul of the whole, When it breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through our will, it is virtue. When it flows through our affections, it is love. Within each of us is the soul of the whole. And we begin to trust that when that spacesuit becomes a little more transparent and fluid and that soul of the whole shines through from within us and it shines into us, we belong to something larger. It's very beautiful, you're just letting the image kind of come into your body, you can begin to sense, well, what if the sense of the story that I live in wasn't so fixed in my day? What if we had more moments where we're just, you know, smelling the honeysuckle or feeling our breath or appreciating another person? That's when that light shines through. So we look at then what does faith appear like when when we start trusting, okay, so there really is something larger I can depend on. One teacher says, is there something beyond death we can depend on, beyond these bodies coming and going? It's the soul of the whole. So what does it look like? How do we begin to relate to difficulty when there's a little more of that trusting? I was sent this last year. One Sunday morning, everyone in one bright, beautiful, tiny town got up early and went to the local church. Before the services started, the townspeople were sitting in their pews talking about their lives, their families, and suddenly Satan appeared. 
He appeared in front of the church and everyone started screaming and running for the front entrance, trampling each other in this frantic effort to get away from evil incarnate. And soon everybody was evacuated from the church except for one uh, elderly gentleman who sat calmly in his pew, not moving, seemingly oblivious to the fact that God's ultimate enemy was in his presence. Now this confused Satan a bit, so he walked up to the man and said, well, don't you know who I am? And the man replied, yep, sure do. Satan asked, aren't you afraid of me? And the response was, nope, I'm not. Satan was a little perturbed at this and then he queried, well, why aren't you afraid of me? And the man calmly responded, been married to your sister for over 48 years. <laughs> So it's, it's a silly story, and here's the teaching point in it, because there is one. I, I, I som sometimes I stretch on my stories, but this one I had a reason. <laughs> um, for many of us, the trials of our life, the failures and the losses, and all the encounters with our own shadow, they can go, they can go in one way or other. They can either amplify mistrust, like get us fixed on something's wrong with me in the world, are, if we're on a path of entrusting ourselves to presence, even when it's difficult, entrusting, entrusting, being with what is, then the very difficulties that arise, the shadow side, actually becomes uh, what they call manure for bodhi, it becomes the actual place of awakening. It becomes a place where we actually learn to find the peace and the freedom within our experience. It's the place where we learn to take refuge in our own awakened heart. And that's the gift, that's the gift of difficulty.